This video is sponsored by Sick. Act now and you can get a free two week subscription to losing your voice, just like me. Details definitely not in the description below. You know, sometimes I find myself scratching my head trying to figure out how to label a game. It's not the genre that throws me off, but rather the theme. It's surprising how it's not always as clear cut as you'd think. Take science fiction for example. It's not just about games set in space with giant robots. The term applies more broadly to the presence of fictional science, which can be as straightforward as a game like Homeworld or more technically titles like Assassin's Creed or Resident Evil. If I really wanted to, I could argue that almost everything except for historical FPS and most fantasy games falls under the umbrella of science fiction, but I'm not about to go down that rabbit hole. It might be pushing things a bit too far and would make choosing games for a review a total nightmare. So you can imagine my dilemma when faced with something like Steel Rising. On one hand, it's technically about robots fighting robots. Sure, it's set during the French Revolution and features a bunch of historical figures from our own world, but I mean, it's robots, right? And okay, they might be clockwork with a sprinkle of magical alchemy, but let's call a spade a spade. They're robots. I do already hear some voices saying it's steampunk, and I did put that in the thumbnail for a reason. They're not wrong, but isn't steampunk a subcategory of science fiction anyway? I mean, the science here is fiction right? Well, I suppose I shouldn't be too surprised when I'm asking questions like this about a game by French studio Spiders. While they've certainly had a history of forgettable games like Bound by Flames or Mars Warlogs and its sequel The Technomancer, recent releases such as Greedfall have provided entirely unique concepts that combine historical eras, magical intrigue, and in the case of Seal Rising, robots. Or automats. His army of indefatigable automats that Monsieur de Vaucanson has built for him. In a sea of same old concepts and settings, they've certainly been carving a unique identity within the gaming market. True, they still haven't reached the upper echelon of quality seen by AAA developers, but I'd say that with games like this, they're well on their way. Alright, let's break down the quirks and curiosities of Steel Rising's story. Now what really sets it apart is how it dives headfirst into its historical setting, the French Revolution. Yes, somehow Spiders has found a way to meld the idea of killer robots and political upheaval in the late 1700s. And you know what? It's not a bad move. An alternative history where mechanical automats clock in for the human workforce, weaving their gears into the political fabric of time isn't a bad idea. Pair that with a time of heavy class separation and paranoia and you have the basis of a really intriguing and original concept. It does also help that there's a very subtle magical element here that the game sort of dances around. Much of it is pushed to subtle hints during the game's story, but I think this de-emphasis really helps separate Steel Rising's ideas from those used in Greedfall. Don't move! Ah, the cursed dancer! May you be devoured by Russ! There is a slight twist that might be a bit polarizing, however. With Steel Rising, every single character is a heavyweight from the history books. No room for faceless nobodies here, it's like a historical who's who extravaganza. And that would be really cool if it weren't for the fact that the cast is, well, massive, and it feels like every single survivor is basically just a historical figure. There are survivors that you can talk to who are hidden behind doors a la something like Bloodborne, however, they don't have anything to do with the story Line. So if you found something like Assassin's Creed a bit cringy because it included historical figures in its storyline, then you're going to find that here in spades. He's taken an automat for his aide to come. You're no more human than the machines that laid waste to this city. Now, even though Steel Rising is a Soulsborne game, it's not holding back on the storytelling front. You aren't going to get the same amount of item description lore or environmental storytelling as its contemporaries. So brace yourself for a narrative roller coaster, with characters nearly always spending exposition about being prime targets for King Louis and the Rasputin esque figure Caligistro. With most of these characters being targets, you start to wonder if these antagonists are as competent as they claim. It seems almost as if only the innocent folks of France have been on the receiving end of their wrath. Political figures caught in the crossfire, they end up in mysterious coffin-like containers, batteries for the game's boss titans powered by their anima. And for those who don't exactly know what an anima is, here, here's that, right here. 
Let me tell you, the story ideas might be odd, but odd doesn't mean bad. There's a method to the madness of steel rising to automats and the whole trapping people in a nightmare coffin thing. Take Aegis for example, a modified dancing automat essentially converted into a weapon. The backstory of why Aegis can talk? Avoiding spoilers is probably one of the most interesting aspects of the game's storyline. There are also a good amount of side quests and a rather hefty DLC plot that add a lot more to the story as well, paired with choices that affect the game's ending. My own opinion on the story is that it was a bit slow and didn't pick up until about halfway through. There are a lot of conversations where you have no choice but to listen to characters and sometimes you feel like skipping a lot of it. This could be because I'm not a very big fan of political intrigue, but especially not a big fan of historical political intrigue. This plot is very niche and it really likes to lean into the era as much as it can. But I was more interested in the reasons why there were automats and how they were made and what the storyline behind the Titans was rather than the economic impact of having an automated workforce. You do get both things, however, there is a whole lot more of the political aspect than anything else. And I can't end this section without mentioning the obvious comparisons that are going to be drawn between Steel Rising and Lies of P. Yes, both are set in France and there are mechanical foes, but beyond that it's a whole different storyline, literally and figuratively. That and Steel Rising came out almost a year prior. So sorry, there's no plagiarism or any sort of gaming drama going on with this one, it just happens to be a really big coincidence. If you've dabbled in Dark Souls, Bloodborne, or more recently, Lies of P, you'll find some familiar beats here. The combat dance is all about learning enemy patterns, exploiting weaknesses, and managing your options strategically. It's a nail-biting experience that borders on frustrating and satisfying, where your character isn't exactly a powerhouse and requires some finesse to take down enemies and bosses. Now, Spiders did put a light twist on the Soulsborne formula with Steel Rising. Enter Aegis, our dancing automat protagonist, who's a tad underpowered. Her combat style demands agility and, no matter how you slice it, stamina management is absolutely crucial. But instead of stamina, we got endurance. It's the stress put on Aegis's metallic body as she goes all out. Run out of it and you're stuck in a cooldown period, freezing Aegis up. Sure, you can hit a button for a quick cooling system, but misuse it and you risk a full on freeze up. This can mean the difference between survival and destruction especially with Steel Rising speedy and aggressive enemies. Combat is all about agility in this game. Aegis, being a dancer, is too slim for heavy armor, so if you're used to tanky builds in your Soulsborne adventures, it's time to get a little more creative. On the flip side, if you like speedier builds, this will feel just right. Steel Rising does throw a bit of a curveball with platforming segments. Aegis gets some useful abilities like mid-air dashes, grappling, and breaking down weak walls. It adds a whole new layer to exploration. As you tackle titan bosses and progress, you unlock shortcuts and discover secrets that seemed unreachable at first. It's where Steel Rising starts carving out its own identity. Granted, it does take a good chunk of hours and some sweaty battles to get there, but these abilities aren't just for show either. They spice up combat, acting as special attacks dealing elemental damage. This adds even more variety to a game filled to the brim with weapon selection. Blades, bladed fans, chains, elemental guns, the choices are plentiful to say the least. Aegis can also slot two weapons, allowing for some slick weapon switching maneuvers. I favor pairing an elemental firearm with a heavy lance so that I could immobilize enemies before dealing massive damage with charged attacks. Now let's talk about the main event here, the boss battles. Steel Rising doesn't skimp on these. Titans, powered by the anima of trapped historical figures, take center stage. Their designs are a wild mix of everything, from ornate stone to lanterns, cannons, and blades. These bosses, fueled by the excess of their antagonist creators, are a sight to behold. There's no shortage of variety in their design, and it makes every encounter unpredictable and generally challenging because you can't exactly zero in on how they function. For those needing a bit of help, Steel Rising introduced an assist mode, something along the lines of the practice mode seen in Contra games. It's a welcoming addition for newcomers or those who prefer a more laid back experience. I personally enjoy Soulsborne games and the rewarding experience it can provide, so I played this game completely vanilla.
so I don't have much experience with this assist mode, but it's there. And hey, there's actually a new game plus mode here as well. This means increased difficulty, fresh opportunities for experience, and alternate story choices for those who want to see different outcomes. When the game works, it looks great. Despite being in complete disarray, spiders still manage to inject quite a bit of life into a game that portrays so much death. There are slums and collapsed war-torn streets galore, yet a lot of the architecture and greenlands often depicted in historical paintings are here too. Almost in defiance of the typical dark and brooding game design that has dominated the industry for decades now, there are entire areas of green, silver, and gold. Not only that, it isn't uncommon to see sections of the game bathed in complete sunlight, taking place alongside picturesque riverside views. There wasn't anything about Steel Rising's environments I didn't like, and again, when it worked, it worked. The game does have a significant amount of texture pop-in, however, no matter what the settings are. At least, this was the case on my PC, which isn't underpowered by any means, but this game is clearly designed for more powerful systems, so it goes without saying that those with a better system are going to have a better time. For a few hours of the game, I didn't find the enemies to be too engaging visually. This was mostly due to me not understanding the reason behind their general design. While a lot of the augments do have the function of being guards or soldiers of some sort, a lot of them are simply Madden utility machines too. So many of them are carrying lamps, shovels, axes, and pickaxes because they were serving some function within the game's many environments before the story began. It allows these enemies to mesh into Steel Rising's world very well. Still, while there does end up being a whole lot of variations of enemies in the game, they always follow a similar look and subset of enemy types. It follows a more structured path for enemy design than just about any other Soulsborne. When it comes to bosses, Steel Rising's designers have excelled at making strange designs that follow the ornate and eccentric nature of 1700s nobility. Titans are designed in a way where they seem more like representations than the functional behemoths of destruction they are intended to be. No matter how powerful or effective a titan is during gameplay, it seems to struggle with both the clockwork nature within and the balking components that it's comprised of. This is a world that hasn't quite got down the idea of efficient design and has merely merged the idea of strange magic and alchemy with clockwork toys and the strength of basic metals and stone. In-game animations are generally consistent and seem to have a high level of polish that complements the combat. Aegis herself has a few noticeable flaws though, being her jumping and item usage animations. Jumping feels alright, but the animation has Aegis looking floppy and rubber-like. It's very noticeable. Her item usage animation is also extremely lazy for no real reason. It almost seems as if the developers wanted to be as fast and non-intrusive to gameplay as possible, so the shortcut was to have her arm reach behind her back. That would have gone unnoticed if I hadn't also realized it when I was using the game's compass item. The biggest hiccup in Steel Rising's design though is the human characters. Despite the rest of the game being somewhat graphically pleasing, they retain a quality similar to something out of the older Assassin's Creed games. Yes, there is a strange doll-like PS3 look to everyone here, and the way they mindlessly stare around and fidget is strange and jarring. Yet, frightful visions, rageful wraiths filled with pain and sorrow. While traversing the environment, a good deal of Steel Rising relies on ambient environmental sounds. Walking about where enemies don't exist is rather peaceful and calm, yet when in the presence of automats, a subtle mechanical beat begins to sound, warning the player that something dangerous is right around the corner. And with Aegis being so underpowered, this can make for some incredibly tense situations. Imagine holding thousands of experience points with no health items left. You're trying to make your way to the next checkpoint after a harrowing battle, only to hear a gathering thump, warning you that something is right around the corner. Now, I'm not exactly the best person to dig into specifics of sound design. If it's good, I'll say it's good. If it's bad, I'll say it's bad. If it's okay, I probably won't notice. Steel Rising certainly falls under the good category. There is a really nice sense of impact when hitting enemies and even being hit yourself, which is strange to say. You can hear the distinctive sounds of metal colliding with metal, with the sound detail sometimes even coming down to capturing the thickness of what you're hitting and how hard. Now when it comes to the voice acting, it isn't half bad, everyone sounds good and no one really phones in their roles. If anyone can help you navigate the obstacles that keep you from the Bastille, 
It is the elusive Monsieur Marat. And I'd leave it just at that. If it weren't for the fact that almost nobody in this game actually has a French accent. Yes, while the entirety of the game takes place in France, everyone sounds as if they're from the UK. I have seen these machines in action. I know all too well their capabilities. Occasionally, a character will say something in French, but this only draws attention to this fact. It's especially baffling that this happened when Spiders is a French developer and Nacon is a French publisher. Steel Rising is a unique Soulsborne with a far out storyline that falls in line with games like Greedfall. Regardless of where you stand on the fence with its storyline, the gameplay becomes incredibly solid as the game progresses. I do feel like more of the game's traditional abilities should have been unlocked somewhat earlier because they give the game so much of its identity when finally implemented. For a Spiders game, this one remains the most competent in terms of scope and design. Unlike the vast majority of their games, the massive areas within have few to no loading times aside from when fast travel occurs. Many of the technical issues and limitations that appeared to be present in even their more popular titles such as Greedfall don't really exist here. No matter where you sit, whether you feel Steel Rising is science fiction or not, I'd say to give this one a chance if you like Soulsborne games. But don't go in expecting Liza P, obviously. This is a different beast entirely. It does have a slower beginning, but when traversal abilities are finally unlocked, Steel Rising opens up. Up. And now that you've made it this far in the video, it seems as if your support abilities have been unlocked. If you like this video, please like and subscribe for a 10% experience boost. And God, I know that was cheesy.